In today's video, David Lithicum and I are going to discuss why you need executive skills to be a cloud architect or an enterprise architect or an AI architect or a security architect. David, how are you today? I'm doing great. Great to be here, Mike. Uh, thank you so much for being here. For those of you that don't know David, he's been an architect for about 35 years now. He's been chief architect, chief technology officer, head of cloud strategy, and he's also an AI expert. For those of you that don't know me, I am a network architect primarily and a security architect primarily, and then worked as an enterprise architect for about 25 years. And uh, I train architects uh, throughout the world that are working at all the world's largest companies. David does so as well. In fact, David and I teach a lot of things together. And David and I constantly talk about the need to have executive skills for the architect and how different the architect role is for the engineer. And yet people ask me every day, Mike, I don't get it. Why does the cloud architect have to have executive skills? So David, I'll ask you that question. Why do cloud architects and enterprise architects and security architects need to have executive skills? Because it's an executive forward position, Mike, at the end of the day. Uh, so I've seen people get into architecture thinking that they're just going to throw around frameworks and uh, you know start driving TOGAP processes and things like that and look at it a very technical role, and it's not. At the end of the day, it's gonna be about communications, it's gonna be about leaderships, it's, it's gonna be about selling to stakeholders, it's gonna be about doing the right things with the technology to enhance the business. And if you don't understand what the business is, you don't have the heart of an executive in doing that and looking out for the needs of the business strategically, you're not necessarily gonna be an effective architect. So people sometimes enter into the architecture role with uh, you know, visions of, uh, of you know very technical jobs and very technical coolness of the technology. And at the end of the day, they go, hey, you know, I've been doing this for a year, Dave, and this is about dealing with people and this is about managing, leading, you know, things like that. I didn't know it was gonna be like that. Absolutely, it's like that. You should have had that expectation going into it. And I we told you that initially when you went into the job. So even though you have the position that's title of architect, and it kind of derives some technical configuration capability and things like that. It's very much a people job. It's very much an executive skills job. It's very much a communication job. And if you don't do that well, you're not going to be a good architect, Mike. Yeah, thank you for that. And I'm going to cover, ask you questions about individually. But you know what? I always felt that the architect job was a soft skills job. And I've trained architects just like you've trained architects for decades now. And for me, I, I we give them a little more tech than they ever need just because we're worried about them passing the interview. And then long term, when people get in the role, they say, Mike, lots of meetings, lots of discussions with executives, lots of discussion with stakeholders, lots of presentations, lots of sales and lots of really uh, leading large teams. And I say exactly what I told you. I told you it's not so technical, but people seem to think it is because they're miscommunicating the architect role and the engineer. So I'm going to hit the business acumen one first. And to me, I always talk about business acumen and the need to understand the business like you described, but also how do we convince the chief financial officer that it's necessary to buy our solution and what our solution is going to do for the business? How do we convince that chief operating officer how our technology will make the business more efficient? How do we convince the CEO and potentially the board to spend money on what we're doing because it's going to exceed their vision? And to me, that's business acumen first. Um, how do you feel about that? No, absolutely. I mean, even understanding some of the concepts such as depreciation, you know, as an architect is very important. Something I didn't do as well when I first got into the job, you know, many years ago. And when the CFOs came to me and they said, okay, you're trying to basically host my stuff onto somebody else's equipment. Uh, we just bought this equipment a couple of years ago. What are you going to do with the depreciation? I, mean, I didn't even think about that. And the reality is I had to have a business understanding of what actions I'm making in buying and selling and configuring the technology that's going to have on the core business. Mean time between failure, lease costs, uh, the ability to look at sizing servers where they don't have to necessarily be upgraded you know, every couple of years and go through the risk around doing that. And so looking at the configuration of technology through the lens of a business person is really what an architect needs to do. Because if you look at it through the lens of a technician, you're going to get completely the wrong yeah. the, the wrong fix on how you need to do your job well. And I always tell people, this is a business job. This is about understanding the business. The more you understand that, the more you're going to be a good architect. The technology is easy. We can teach you that very quickly and how to do the charts yeah. and draw the pretty yeah. graphs. And we have AI to automate much of that stuff yeah. right now. But the ability to make decisions, the ability to lead technological configurations, ability to lead people, 
communicate it and also understand the essence of the business and how to make the business successful is really what the job is all about. And it's, it's nothing less. Yeah. And, and that's the secret, at least for the business acumen. And you mentioned stakeholders and sales. So I will tell you that I was, here's how I was told I needed to learn sales. I tried to convince a patient to take a medication that was going to be in their best interest. Uh, they, when I was in my old internal medicine days, they basically said, no, thank you. I had a preceptor at the time and he handed me this book from Dale Carnegie that says how to win friends and influence people. And he said, Mike, if you want to practice medicine, you need to sell your patients into taking their medication. And then when I went to architecture, the first job, the second architect job I had was on, on Wall Street. It was designing the largest mark. They were the largest maker on the NASDAQ. They were designing the fastest tr trading system in the world. And when I was there, the chief technology officer came to me. I met him on my first day as an architect there. And he said, Mike, no matter any single thing you want to bring to me, and a Jerry Maguire had come out a few years before that, he says, show me the money. And I said, what do you mean? He says, you want to put a $10 million, net piece, $10 million in networking gear? Show me how it's going to make me $50 million or more. You can do that. It's fine. And then he said, the technology, in order to upgrade it, needs to be two out of the three, better, faster, or cheaper. He said, all three, we almost always wanted a competitive advantage. And they were the guidelines that really helped me. And he was not a business, a, a tech person. He literally was a Wall Street executive that was pulled in as a chief technology officer. And they hired a team of architects. And he says, well, you help me. And I need to know the business. And that's where I learned so much about that. Yeah, I used to be used to be me. I was taken back by, you know, working with my clients during my CTO days when I was, uh, you know, CTO of three different uh, EAI companies, enterprise application integration. And I used to talk to the CEOs and the CIOs in that mix all the time. And I would tell them, look at the value of this technology. You don't have to code interfaces between source and target systems. And we're able to automate many of the things that wouldn't be automated till still then. And it was taken back by some of the responses for them. They said, great, this is amazing technology. Tell me when I'm the thousandth person who buys that. And I understood that there was a cost of risk. And they were understanding that the cost of risk and buying something is relatively new was going to be a lot higher, you know, versus them, uh, you know, going through the cycles and having other people debug the product and they'd be the right. thousandth person into it. And these were all new beta tested products at the same time. And I kind of changed my perspective. And I said, that really makes sense. So at the end of the day, we have to figure out what the risk is of implementing the technology, yeah. not necessarily chasing the technology that we think is going to have a good effect, but the technology that has the right effect in bringing the most optimized value back to the business. And that's a different problem in solving altogether. It's not just basically getting the technology together that's going to be always right and optimized for everybody else out there in a general purpose way, but which ones are going to be optimized for that particular business. And when the CEOs would talk to me about that, they would have to, ex they'd have to correct me many times. It's not right. about the industry. You're telling me about the industry. Yeah. Tell me about how it's going to affect my business. And in doing so, look at the requirements, figure out where the risk, where the risk metrics are. When should I implement it? When can I be successful? How can I be successful with the technology? And it's a completely different eye-opening experience, Mike, in terms of what we need to consider yeah. uh, in terms of looking at technology and how to sell technology. So I never sold technology any different up until then. So in other words, I all took an, took an objective lens, you know, heart of a teacher, not the heart of a salesperson, and the yeah. ability to have an empathetic understanding. And the biggest thing is an architect, your ability to open your ears and listen to what your client has to say, because it's the most important thing you need to listen to. Don't tell them where the industry is going. Don't tell them how this technology is so cool. Understand what their business is, the essence of it, what their what are their metrics for success, where are they taking the business, and how to configure a technology solution is going to be right for them. And it's not going to be right for the people down the street and the people down the street from them. It's going to be right for them. And that's why architects exist. They exist to create bespoke technology solutions that solve specific business problems that can be valued to the business. Yeah, and that's the difference between an architect and somebody's well-architected framework that gives everybody in the entire world the exactly same treatment. Absolutely. That's yeah. not an architecture. That's a cookie cutter recipe. The problem is if you want, if you need to give something that for someone that's allergic to something, how do you do oh, the recipe? None of that's in those kind of frameworks. So I'm a hundred percent with you. And you know, when you think about it, gathering that information, you just mentioned listening is the most important thing. I agree with you. That now means communication skills are the one of the most critical skills for the architect. Get the information wrong. The architecture's wrong. But I love the way you went back to the business. I went back to the business. I thankfully I came from Cisco and you had a lot of time with IBM and, and big four consulting companies. They were always, how do we make the business better? 
And I can remember at Cisco, they were sending all of us, go get your MBA, go get executive presence training, go get training on exercising influence. And I took it and I took it willingly, but I didn't realize the impact it was going to make to me until I was actually into bigger architecture roles when it became less and less technical and more about the process to do something and more about the business architecture. And then more about, oh, you and I've done those enterprise architecture roles for a few decades and I kind of like them. Yeah, absolutely. And the, and the thing is, too, it, it becomes with a maturity of sorts, as people kind of understand, you know, as they go through the career and understanding where the value actually lies. And I, I dealt with mentoring, you know, hundreds of architects, you know, uh, you know, throughout my career and certainly in my last gig. And at the end of the day, they didn't necessarily have a perspective as to what it is when they got out of college. And they no. didn't have people who taught them uh, what architecture was. They had computer science degrees, management information systems degrees. Uh, some of them had business degrees, but they, they didn't understand how they apply the technology. And everybody was basically chasing concepts at that time. Yeah. At that time, and just like they're doing that now, they're chasing yeah. generative AI, agentic AI, you know, AIG stuff, all the hot commodity technology that's out there, and they're leading the sale and the way in which they're communicating with their clients with that kind of a with that kind of a pitch. In other words, it's not I'm going to solve the issue around your business, understand your business, make sure we have the right the exact right technology solution to make it happen. They push we're going to solve this using generative AI. It was, you know, 13 years ago, we're going to solve this using cloud technology. I even had architects who would go to client meetings and sit down and write the problem configuration using AWS technology before they understood a lick about what the business needed and what the business was trying to go. And so they're immediately throwing technology at the problem. That has the opposite of the desired effect because yes. the business is going to look at you like a, you know, like someone who's not bothering to understand where they're yeah. going and what's happening. And for a while, I think the, the enterprise stakeholders, uh, they tolerated it. Uh, certainly with the growth of cloud, they did. Yeah. And then after a while, they don't. And you go out there yeah. now and basically try to sell AI to somebody now an agentic, generative, whatever, without an understanding of how it's going to be used in the business. They need that explanation first. Yeah. And that's something in terms of how the market has changed. So we're not just chasing technology for technology's sake. We're yeah. not pushing the same technology across the board and com you know trying to find commonality with the implementation of yeah. it. It's always going to be bespoke use of technology, and that's going to take an architect to make it happen. Yeah, and 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 I and you know if we talk about it for others to understand, that's an impact analysis that we would do as an architect. Uh, that, for example, that's understanding what happens when you make one change to the system. It's planning the impact of the technology on the employees, and all of this is all executive skills. So that's why David and I are constantly talking about executive skills for the architect. We don't build anything as architects. We've got to get it from the client, understand their business, because if you don't understand business and their business. What kind of solution are you creating? Absolutely, Mike. So that's why we, David and I today talked about why you need executive skills for an architect. Uh, if you'd like to uh, learn more about how to become a cloud architect or an enterprise architect or an AI architect or a security architect, join us for any of the free webinars. If it's an AI architecture webinar, David will be on it as well because he's the chief architect and chief instructor of our AI architect program. If it'll be on executive architecture work, you'll hear from David and I. Or if it's related to security architecture, AI architecture, come join us in a free webinar. We'll talk about what we do, what we really do as an architect, the actual skills you need as an architect, and what you need to do to stand out uh, get uh, interviews and even what to do to win the interview and those types of things. We talk about it uh, twice a week on free architecture webinars. Uh, you can register for any of these free webinars in the description of this video. While you're in the description of this video, there's many free guides. I wrote some, David wrote a few of them on how to build your career, like how to become an enterprise architect or a cloud architect or an AI architect. There's guides on how to pass the interview and they're all free. So sign up, they'll be emailed to you. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like, uh, subscribe to our channel, maybe subscribe to David Lithicum's channel as well. Uh, he always has some great things to offer and uh, hope to see you in another video soon. Take care, everyone.